if we can go back to caveman times with machine guns, how many like waves of cavemen do you think we could take out? Me and you. Depends how many bullets we have. Probably however many bullets we have. That's it. That's how. That's how fun. Infinite ammo. I think we'd do all right until we had to sleep. I think then we'd be good. Do you think if we like slayed all of the cavemen though, like we wouldn't like live when we go back in the time machine and go back to like present day? Would like we be dead too? Because we killed all the cavemen. That's for sure. I mean, we'd have to kill hundreds of cavemen. So you know that would uh, definitely change a man. So we'll mm. see. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Yeah, for sure. What is going on, everybody? It is your guy Tyler here, Mom's Basement MMA, and I am really jacked to have my next guest on, the quiet man, Dylan Mantello. This guy is just a pleasure to watch. He's 10-0 and 0 when you include his AMI career. Um, he fights out of Long Island, New York, and he's training out of the Sarah Longo gym. So, Dylan, first and foremost, man, thank you for your time, and thank you for being here. Thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Uh, yep, Long Island, Sarah Longo guy. So, 10-0, uh, and 0, undefeated fighter. Um, looking to make some waves in the next uh, 12 months or so. So, thank you for having me. So... I have to ask the quiet man that is like one of the most badass nicknames I think I've ever like come across like how did that come about stopping in and out how, how did I get the nickname uh the nickname started um just kind of randomly I was you know you kind of wait in the gym to try to wait for somebody to give you a nickname you know you're not supposed to come up with your own nickname um you know but I'm kind of a quiet guy by nature um and you know, I was kind of going around the gym, new guy in the gym, people, you know, several long ago, they like to kind of break balls and, you know, figure out, you know, you get a nickname that way. But, uh, you know, I'm kind of, I'm a little uh, hard to approach sometimes. So I think guys felt a little bit you know, unsure whether they should, you know, be breaking my balls or not. Um, so I had, a, you know, I had two, three fights and I was doing well and I was like, you know, I need a nickname. So I got it. So I had to come up with my own nickname. Um, and it came from uh, a John Wayne movie that I watch uh, every uh, St. Patrick's Day with my dad. It's called The Quiet Man. It's about a boxer from Pittsburgh um, to kind of get away from fighting because he killed a man in the ring and he winds up, uh, you know, trying to start a new life. And he realizes that, you know, fighting is part of his life and that he needs to new, find, you know, new reasons to fight and that, you know, fighting is good for the right reasons. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been something that um, was important to me, you know, my whole life growing up. And there's just an awesome, uh, you know, John Wayne's a, a, you know, a fantastic character in history, um, somebody that I look up to. So the name stuck and wound up working. And, uh, you know, that was that's how it goes. That's kind of cool because it has like a slightly humorous meaning and a serious one. And it's like a pretty good combination of both. That's like perfect for you then. Yeah, it seems to be pretty good too. I mean, I don't like to talk a lot of shit, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of like to do my talking when I'm in the octagon. Um, so it fits me in that way too. You know, I like to keep it humble, find out what I'm all about when I'm in the cage. So expression, the good Lord gave you two ears and one mouth. And listen twice as much as you speak. As a mixed martial arts fan, one of the things that like just kind of annoys me is some of the pre-fight banter because it's just like insincere and plastic and it, like yes occasionally there are two guys out there that really hate each other like John Jones and Daniel Cormier like that that's legitimate beef they don't like each other but the manufactured beef and like the stupid insults and stuff it's just like this is so stupid like I could do without this like pro wrestling soap opera can we just like fight yeah yeah i think the most attractive thing to me uh in selling a fight is just people being genuine i'd rather see somebody be quiet and genuine than try to talk a whole bunch of shit and try to manufacture something um so i think i think the fans can tell when something's real and when it's not but um you know i don't like to be friendly with my opponents either you know i, I do like to make sure everybody knows that this is a fight um you know and i'm and i'm in there to take this person out because you know, he's trying to take me out. So I'm, I'm serious, you know, I'm deadly serious when I'm in there hands and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, even without the talk shit, you know, without the shit talking, it's, uh, it's, it's serious business when I'm in there. So, uh, you know, I don't need to talk. I like to, I like to lead with my actions. Well, you certainly do. I mean, undefeated and, uh, at 155 pounds being six foot one inches tall. I mean, you got that, like, it's not. It's just rare you see somebody that big at 155. I mean, Cowboy used to fight at 155, and he's probably roughly the same size as you. I don't think people realize like how big that guy is until they see him. Like Donald Cerrone is 
fucking huge. And so are you. I mean, six foot one. So I have to ask, a guy your size making 155, like, is that is that hard for you? Um, surprisingly, no. I mean, I, yes, I am a, I am a very large l- lightweight, you know, um, I haven't seen any, uh, lightweights my size, especially, you know, competing against them. But, um, as far as the weight cut goes, honestly, no, it's not that hard for me. It's, uh, it's pretty surprisingly easy. You know, the last two pounds or so, are you know, always going to be a grind. Um, but you know, I, I'm very disciplined, uh, year round with my diet and with my, uh, you know, hydration and things like that. So I'm always in shape. Uh, so I think some of the guys that have, you know, a hard time making the weight is the guys who really go off the wagon, you know, in between fights. And, uh, that's not, that's not who I am. I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm a martial artist. You know, I try to make sure that, um, I could be ready to fight at a, at a moment's notice. So, um, yeah, my diet is very, very strict and, um, you know, it pays off, you know, 18 months or so, you know, COVID stuff going on. Everybody was kind of scrambling for fights. And some people had long layoffs because, you know, they just either weren't ready or they saw it. They said, Oh, fuck it. Nobody's running shows anyway. You know, why am I going to, you know, why am I going to train and be disciplined? But I took the opposite attitude. I said, you know, the people that are going to get opportunities are getting and staying in shape. And, you know, I wound up having two or three fights during COVID lockdown stuff. Some of the earliest shows that were doing it. So I really didn't have any kind of downtime. Um, you know, due to COVID. So um, it's just a little shit like that, you know, people that, you know, proper preparation prevents poor performance, you know, and those are uh, going to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. So that's, that's kind of how I live my life. You know, it's funny that you mentioned like the whole Rona thing. One of the fighters I had on probably about a month ago, I don't remember who it was, but it was a regional fighter. And he told me, he was like, we're about to find out a lot about coronavirus. We're going to find out who the pretenders are. He's like, because I guarantee you when all this shit ends and it's time to, you're supposed to be back in the gym, we'll find out who was really serious and who wasn't. And he's like, I guarantee you there's going to be like a third of the guys in the gym that stopped showing up. And, you know, I don't know if it was quite that number or not, but, you know, he talked about there are a lot of guys that he hasn't seen them since things have kind of sort of got back to normal has that been the case with you as well or not really yeah i mean i was lucky that you know sarah longo is such a close-knit you know family um where you know we're all looking out for each other and things like that and you know we had we you know we had you know the ability to train together outside the gym and then you know try to get in the gym privately and things like that so um it was lucky that you know we did you know we're all pretty disciplined you know we're all on the same page we all want to compete we all want to fight um, but you know, it is, it is unfortunate, you know, I do know Taylor into their career where they maybe had one or two fights left and, you know, it just kind of caused an early retirement for them, but you know, everything happens for a reason, I guess. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, it gave me an opportunity to, you know, take some time to, you know, add some new skills and, 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 uh, maybe, and really build stronger relationships with everybody actually. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I had fights, I had, I was active, um, you know, a, a few guys fought in, uh, Abu Dhabi and, um, you know, they, they did the UFC event. Uh, I think I felt worse for the amateur guys because they really weren't running any amateur shows whatsoever. The pro fights kind of sooner. So we just had a couple teammates fight, um, you know, the last few weekends, get trying to get back on track with their amateur career. So, uh, it's good. Everything's coming back now. It's, it, it looks, uh, it looks good. They're starting to have the UFC events with crowds and stuff. So I'm looking forward to, um, uh, you know, getting on one of those cards soon because, uh, you know, I live, I like, I live to, I love fighting in front of people. And, and, you know, that's my dream is to fight in the field arenas and shit. You know, I don't want to fight in the apex and do all this kind of stuff where it's, you know, quiet. It feels like a sparring session. I want to be under the bright lights and I want to be, uh, you know, in a packed arena, you know, entertaining, you know, that's, that's, that's how I look at it. So I have to ask you, like my, my wife is from upstate New York. And so we go there, I live in the DC area. So we go there probably like, I don't know, a handful of times a year. It's not that far. And like New York State was like shut down. Like we've been there throughout the coronavirus and whatnot. Like things were shut down. So the question becomes like, how did you manage to like keep in shape? And like, what did you have to do to like get your sparring in and just kind of like stay active during uh, all those closures? Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I mean, it hit the worst. Um, so, you know, we're on Long Island. It was a little bit better. Obviously, everything closed for a while. Um, but I know a lot of the guys like Henzo Gracie's in Manhattan, uh, you know, the the Danaher death squad, uh, you know, wound up actually retiring the team because they wound up, you know, having to split up. up. So who knows where that team would have gone, you know, if they were allowed to, you know, co- you know, to continue to train. Um, so, you know, you know, I, we look at our team like a family. So, you know, I wound up, uh, you know, basically building a, you know, a little, a matted area in my house. 
Um, you know, a few of the guys did so as well. And, you know, you just have to find a way to get it done and get your work in because, uh, you know, you just got to look through it, you know, you got to see what, what, what it will have an end, you know, and you need to be ready. You don't want to be playing catch up when it's all said and done. So, so it's, it's been tough, but you know, tough times make tough people. So, um, you know, we're, we're We've grown from it, and uh, I think we've even come together more as a team. So we're looking forward. We're looking forward to uh, you know getting past it and, and and big fights on the horizon. So Dylan, let's talk a little bit about Sarah Longo. Um, everyone who follows the sport knows that's one of the like most reputable gyms in the entire country. Um, the best of the best train there. I won't go through the roster, but Sterling, Ally Akinta, uh, Chris Weidman, et cetera, et cetera. There are tons of guys that are there. Um, can you tell me a little bit, like, how did you get hooked up, uh, with Sarah Longo? Like, how did you start training up with them? How did, how did that work out? Yeah. So I I was born and raised in Long Island. I'm a Long Island guy. Um, but I did do my, uh, undergrad at, uh, LSU. I I moved away for a while and, uh, I started training when I was in college, actually, like uh, as soon as I got there freshman year, I got dropped off in Louisiana and, uh, you know, MMA was something that I always wanted to do. Um, I was always fighting, you know, getting in a lot of street fights and stuff as a kid. So I was always fascinated by fighting and, uh, you know, I always did pretty well. Um, so, you know, it kind of helped form my identity around fighting. Um, so then when I realized, you know, I could go really learn how to do this, um, I, I jumped at the opportunity, you know. So I started training down there, um, doing my schoolwork just to do my schoolwork. And I was really uh, on training and, and getting fights booked and things like that. And as soon as I graduated my undergrad, I said, this is, you know, I, I, I wound up doing my master's at Hofstra, which is right down the block from Sara Longo. And, uh, you know, I, I, one day I was sitting in class, like, man, I do not even want to be here right now. This sucks. I, you know, I know what I want. So I just Googled like, you know, where is, where is, you know, Weidman's gym and like, where are these guys training? And I Googled it. It was actually right down the block from where I was. It was like four minutes away. So I, uh, I said, okay, I'm, I'm leaving. I, I got out of the class and I just got in my car and I drove to the gym and I, and, you know, I got the courage to go in there and I was like, you know, how do I sign up? So I'm, I'm doing, I'm filling out the paperwork and Ray Longo walks out and he's like standing right at the counter. I'm like, Oh shit. Like, you know, Ray's a very inti- like, you know, intimidating guy. He's got very piercing eyes. And like, I was like, Holy shit. Like, you know, I figure, you know, Ray Longo would stop by every once in a while, but no, the guy was there every single day training in kickboxing class. I was like, you're every day training people to fight. I was like, I'm sold, you know? So I showed up the next day. I showed up the next day. I just kept coming back, kept coming back. Um, you know, I, I, I think Ray could tell right away that I had some talent, so he, you know, we got a, we got a kickboxing fight booked, you know, he threw me in there, my first a savage from the gym. And, you know, I think he wanted to see what I was made of, you know, threw me to the wolves and, uh, you know, I did pretty well. So I think he knew that he had something at that point. And, um, you know, I'm a hard worker. So just went from there and, uh, you know, training with guys like Ally Quinta and, and Al Jermaine and, you know, all these guys, we got a bunch of guys coming up in the lightweight team. So, you know, we're just growing together and, and, you know, iron sharpens iron. So I think, uh, you know, we're going to, we're gonna we're gonna make some big waves here in the in the, in the coming twelve months or so for sure. Dylan, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your amateur career. Uh, had six bouts, at least that's what Tapology says. That may not be a hundred percent accurate. There might be more in there um, that just aren't accounted for. And you blew through everybody. Um, you're just chewing through guys, and like there are a lot of parallels between your professional career and then your ami career. And we'll get into your professional side and just what you've been up to lately. But I wanted to kind of like put a bookmark there and stop because there are a lot of people that um, listen into the show that I have on the show that are Amis. And some of them are just getting started. uh, Really great talents and they're aspiring to like get at your level. And when you reflect back on what you learned throughout your Ami career, like what kind of advice or what kind of wisdom would you impart on people that are on the Ami scene right now that are trying to get to your level? It's a good question. Um, you know, I do try to help out with some of our amateur guys on the team. I like to, you know, I, they, I've cornered a few of them, you know, a lot of, you know, you know, I, I learn a lot from Ray. I try to, I try to be a coach in the gym as well for a lot of the guys. So I, I think a lot of guys look up to me. Um, you know, I think experience is just a big part. You know, I, I was lucky enough, well, lucky enough. I, I had a bunch of street fights growing up, you know, so I got used to that um, the energy where somebody's trying to put you unconscious in front of everybody, you know, it, that's a weird feeling to be in that situation. And you need to, nobody's going to save you. You're in there. You need to save yourself. Um, so you need to make sure that you train hard so that you're prepared for that opportunity. Those are the building blocks. 
Um, you know, win or lose, it's an amazing experience that only, you know, less than 1% of the population will ever do. So you should be proud of yourself even for just competing. But, um, you know, when you're in there, you should be in there to win. And you need to understand that this person's trying to hurt you and you need to hurt them. You know, it's, it's a dark reality of it. Um, but you know, after you get through it on the other side of it, then you can enjoy it. But, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a violent sport. So you need to be prepared. You know, again, our coaches, you know, if, if you're taking a fight, Ray Longo is going to make sure that you're in shape. So, um, you know, if, if you're, if he's in your corner, pretty prepared fighter. So, um, that's something that I try to impart to the guys, you know, some guys are just, you know, nice guys. Um, but you need to be able to flip that switch and, and realize that you got to take somebody out. But again, the amateur fights is, is building blocks for your career. You know, you can't let a loss absolutely destroy you. You know, you should be, you should be destroyed for a while because it should be much to you. But, um, you know, you do need to realize that uh, it's the building blocks for your career. And, and it's each fight, you know, builds you as a fighter and builds you as a person. So it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a great sport. I love martial arts. And uh, I think anybody that competes, whether they win, lose, or draw is, has my respect. So you mentioned a couple different times that you were in street fights. Are we talking like Kimbo type shit? Or are we talking about like actual like beefs with people that you had to settle or a little bit of both? Yeah, it's kind of a little bit of both. I mean, I wound up getting in, you know, kind of a lot. Of, you know, I was kind of a tough kid. Um, you know, I was probably fighting for the wrong reasons in the beginning. I wound up, you know, sticking up for myself a few times and did pretty well. And then, you know, you know, it goes in like high school, you know, it's everybody thinks, okay, well, he's, he's a pretty tough guy. I think I want to be a tough guy and winds up turning into this thing where everybody kind of wanted to fight me for some reason. Um, and in my town, you know, on Long Island, it's, you know, the towns are very close to the border and, you know, it kind of goes like that. So, you know, if you, if you go to the, if you go to the town nearby you and, you know, there's some, you know, beef from like, you know, different people that, you know, or something like that, you know, there's always problems going on. There's a lot of testosterone flying around. So, um, yeah, so I wound up, you know, b being in a lot of like one-on-one, -on -one, you know, fights in the street where people, you know, nobody was jumping in. It was it was basically like an MMA fight where it was, you know, do or die, you know, situation. So it was it was pretty crazy. I, I'm 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 you know very thankful that I wasn't uh, seriously injured, you know, doing that because it's very dangerous. There's no referee, you know, there's no referee out there that's going to if you go unconscious. You know, you better hope the guy is nice enough to stop if he drops you and he knocks you unconscious and you don't get your head stomped in, you know what I mean? So that's something that I had to kind of deal with at a younger age. Um, and then when I got in the cage, you know, I was like, I got these gloves on, I got a mouthpiece and I got the ref in here. That's going to stop this guy. If he ends up, if he does end up beating me. So I, you know, I just kind of felt comfortable in that situation. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's not something that I would suggest people do, but it, it has helped me in, in my career. So. Dylan, like one of the things that I ask this question occasionally, and for the people that may me hear me ask the question for the first time, like you'll pause and be like, Tyler, are you like dumb? That's like the dumbest question you could ever ask. But surprisingly, like there's a reason why I ask, and maybe Dylan can describe it. Do you, Tough guys find out that you're an MMA guy and like you're at a bar or whatever at Top Golf and you get some asshole who's just like, oh, I could kick that guy's ass. Like, does that happen to you or does that happen to like people that you train with? Yeah, I mean, I don't have anybody mess with me. The, the irony is that as soon as I actually fight anymore, you know, so that's kind of how it goes. Um, you know, people can just probably sense, you know, it's just not somebody to fuck with. Um, you know, but also, you know, I'm getting older, you know, you realize that it's, uh, you know, it's dangerous out there and you shouldn't be putting yourself in those situations. So I'm, I don't really find myself in those situations anymore. Um, you know, and plus, if you're good at something, you should never do it for free. So I'm not out here fighting in the streets, you know, every weekend, cause, you know, at a, at a bar, you know, shit like that. So, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's good to have it. You know, I say it's better to have it, not need it, than need it, not have it kind of type of situation. So, you know, I have a stepson. I have, you know, I plan on having children, um, girl or boy, I'm going to make sure that they're in martial arts, you know, like as if, as it, you know, they're going to be able to read, they're going to be able to do math and they're going to be able to defend themselves just in case those are, those, those things should be, um, you know, more ingrained in our society. I think, I think it would do a lot of good, um, you know, for, for general, if, if people understood martial arts and were really, you know, understood what it is to be in an altercation like that, I think the, the world would be a more peaceful place um, if more people train martial arts. So, um, you know, I try to be the change that I want to see in the world, you know, so martial arts, then that will listen and, and, you know, I do some training and stuff. So I've seen it make a big difference in my life. I've, and I try to, you know, I try to share that and have it make a difference in other people's lives as well. Good for you for being a uh, stepfather. Um, 
uh, my hat's off to you. I greatly admire that. Uh, you know, my uh, wife is a stepmother, and you know, every once in a while, I like pause and reflect and like think like what she must be like looking, how she might be like trying to handle a situation or just how difficult it is. And you know, I don't have that perspective. But uh, you're a special man and a special person for, for signing up for that. Because when you're a step parent, you're signing up for that. Um, and that, you know, good on you, man. Like, I think that's fantastic. It was easy for me. I mean, I met my, I met my fiance now and, uh, you know, she's amazing. She's the love of my life. So I couldn't wait to marry her. Um, you know, and I met Jordan. He's, he's basically, you know, like a mini little, little version of her. So I fell in love with them both very quickly. Um, and you know, you need to find things in life that are meaningful. You know, you can't just go around doing things just because they feel good or, you know, you think that this is, you know, the best thing for you. Sometimes the best thing for you is doing the best thing for others that you care about. So, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a paradox, but, uh, you know, I appreciate the compliment. Thank you. I mean, it, it does mean a lot to me, um, to, to help raise Jordan. Um, he's in a great, he's a great kid and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, I, I feel like the lucky one. That's I'm sure, I'm sure you're, 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 part, you're a significant other Both the same way. Yeah. And you know, again, man, it's just, uh, uh, you're a special guy for that. Um, let's shift gears and talk about your pro career. Um, I've seen your professional fights. You've only been professional since 2019. So the first question is what was the switch that flipped where you and your coaches decided like, we're ready now we're going pro uh, now's the time. I think I'm, I've, I've been an uh, amateur career. Um, but you know, you do need to get the reps in, like I said, you need to have the experience in there, um, to, you know, be able to put it all together in the cage. Ray has a saying, you know, he's like, when you're in there, you know, when you go pro, you got to be squared away. You can't be trying to fill holes in your game. Um, you know, when you turn pro, because these, these, these are serious fights now. So, um, you know, by the, by the end of my, by the end of my amateur career, I felt a little, um, I wasn't very motivated. You know, I was collecting some amateur titles, um, which helped, you know, I like to, I like to have the belts, you know, you keep those forever. But um, by my last opponent, I was kind of, I was ready to turn pro. But you see the guys around turning pro and you think, um, you know, this is something that I, that I should be doing at this point. So um, as soon as I turned pro, I had a, I had a very tough fight too. I had a, I, my pro fight was against a guy who was two and now he wound up taking the fight on short notice because, you know, it was hard finding me opponents. A few guys dropped out. Um, so I wound up, you know, fighting a guy that was two and zero, I said, "Okay, let's go." I've never turned down a fight in my life, so I'll fight anybody. So that was a that was a good experience for me. That was probably my toughest fight. Um, so, um, you know, it flipped the gear for me too. And since then, I've I've, I've had three finishes uh, of my of my pro my pro career. So I think I'm in a good place right and to have a title fight in October for Ring of Combat, and then you know, hoping Dana White Contender Series makes a call, or if not, I'm going to keep collecting some pro titles. Um, you know, in the meantime, so. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I, I think I'm squared away. I have the best coaches in the world. I have the best, you know, team in the world. So you're fighting for a the lightweight belt in October with ROC? Yep. Ring of Combat lightweight title. is uh, My last fight was a title limit. So I got a 45-second knockout first round. Uh, so they're booking me for the title fight. So that's going to be going right there. It's going to be the next belt. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that should be a good one. And then hopefully uh, moving on to, uh, you know, bigger and better things. Do you know who you're fighting yet? Or are you not allowed to say? I've asked for a few guys. I think they might be having a little bit of difficulty getting me opponents. It's, yeah. been, it's been tough. Uh, Ray was telling me, you know, Weidman, Weidman was actually having the same problems at this point in his career. You know, it was, it was tough getting them opponents to sign them down the line. So he wound up making a jump to the UFC, I think, 6-0 and or 7-0, and mm -hmm. um, you know. I think that's just a testament to our coaches too. I mean, we, they, they get us so ready so quickly that, um, you know, we wind up speeding past some of these guys. So, you know, I don't know. I, I'll fight anybody, like I said. So hopefully they can get somebody. Um, I, I have a, there's one person in the ring of combat who's working his way up. He's a, I, I believe he's undefeated or he has another, or he has, you know, five and one or something. I think uh, Nick Rodriguez, I've been asking to fight him and uh, you know, I don't know what the deal is, but I haven't seen a contract. So I don't know if he's trying to down the fight or he doesn't want to fight me or he, you know, thinks he wants to fight somebody else, but I don't know why, he, I don't know why he doesn't want to fight. So um, hopefully they can make that one happen. I like the matchup. Um, so we'll, we'll try to make that one. I'm going to try to make that one. And uh, if not, he can go fight somebody else or do whatever he wants. I don't know why he wouldn't want to fight for the title, but I'm thinking through if I were like one of that, if I were like a coach, like for Rodriguez, like why we wouldn't take the fight. So my answer right away being like the outsider looking in would be, 
I think he's close and you're a risky fight. And if you fuck it up, I might not be able to get him on the contender series. No, I agree. I mean, I get it. I, I, I understand why you guys wouldn't want to fight me, but you know, you've been fighting from your combat three or four fights now. So why, why wouldn't you want to fight? The fighting's about truth. Let's, let's find out. Why do you, what are you trying to skirt around the truth for then? If that's the reason, you know, these guys like try to like make up these reasons for like trying to get to get ahead. You should get ahead because you're the best. Let's fight and find out if you're not the best, let's find out. And then you could go from there. Think about the adjustments that you're going to need to make. Why do people try to get, everybody's looking for a shortcut. I don't look for, I don't look for shortcuts. I don't give a shit about shortcuts. I want to find out if I'm not the best, then I want to find out as possible. You know what I mean? So, you know, that, uh, I get it, but it doesn't doesn't relate to me. So, um, yeah, it doesn't, you know, whoever they whoever they can get for me is gonna is gonna is gonna get it. So, definitely be checking that out. Um, you are incredibly gifted, and I wanted to talk about Dennis Hughes for a minute. I did a full fight breakdown of that fight, and Dennis Hughes is an incredible fighter. Um, and if he took that fight on short notice against you. Um, I mean, Jesus, dude, that was a scrap. And uh, I have nothing but uh, yeah, nice, I, I, I have nothing but nice things to say about Dennis. Yeah, he's, he was definitely one of those guys. I think that he's like me. He stays in shape year round. Um, you know, he was a pretty quiet guy himself. So I knew, you know, I knew there was I knew he had uh, uh, some heart to him. Um, I don't think he had enough uh, power or or. Uh, you know, he was good. He had good conditioning, good striking, but, uh, you know, you have to be something very, very special to take me out. And, uh, I, you know, you know, props to him. He took a lot of, he took a lot of damage too. So that was, uh, that was a good fight for me. It's a growing fight. A lot of respect for that guy. I think I, I messaged him a few times after the fight too. let him know that, you know, a lot of respect for him. I, I think he's doing pretty well too. I think he's got uh, a few, a few more, a few wins since then. So I think we both grew from it. You know, one of us has to win and one of us has to lose, but I think we both wound up winning because, um, you know, it was a big, moment for us to to find out what we're made of yeah that guy was a savage it was a fight and he he's already done something that not a lot of men have been able to do against you and that's go the distance like you finish fights you're a fight finisher you knock people out you make people submit uh with your jiu-jitsu like you are so good at everything and after the hughes fight it's like the other guys, like, let's run through the other guys. You fought Jake Sw uh, Swinney, Jerome, Mickel, Felipe, Diaz. So the Sweeney guy, I don't know if I'm saying his name right or wrong. But from the clip I saw, that guy looked like he didn't even want to be in there. Like, you must have, like, really pieced him up because it looked like he, his gloves were, like, at his waist. He looked hurt. And, like, I'm surprised his corner, like, didn't save him from, from himself. Like, I don't know why they let him go out for another round because he looked like he didn't want to be in there against you. Yeah, I mean, uh, he was, he was a, I think, a black belt in jiu-jitsu. I saw him tap out a few high-level guys in the EBI and shit like that, hardcore jiu-jitsu guy. So he knew what he had to do. He went all out to try to take me to the floor, um, you know, pushed me against the cage. But I have good takedown defense, too. I was drilling him with elbows, you know, really wearing him out. So... Um, I think he really, he gave everything that he had to try to get me down. And, and once he realized he wasn't going to get me down and that second round started, um, you know, he was in trouble and, uh, he knew it, I knew it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a patient guy though, too. I, I'll, I'll make sure that I finish the fight the way that I want to fight it. I'm not going to rush it just because I know you're tired. Um, so I had plenty of time to work and I wound up, uh, you know, get, getting that highly real knockout. So it was a good experience for me. It was down in Florida, like I said, during COVID. So uh, it was a good opportunity, and I, I wound up capitalizing. But, again, a lot of respect to that guy, too. I have a lot of respect for anybody that steps in the cage with me because, um, you know, it's pretty undeniable that they're getting in They're getting in there with somebody that's, um, you know, a very big lightweight to start with and somebody that has skills. So, um, you know, undefeated as well. So anybody that steps in there with me, I have respect for. I have more respect for guys like that than I do for some other guys that might have an undefeated record, but, you know, don't, don't end up uh, wanting to fight me. So... Um, you know, like I said, martial arts is about respect, and uh, you know I respect all my opponents. I'll fight you in UFC four. <laughs> That's about it, though. Next, it a video game. I, don't, I don't know about. Oh that. man, I I might be the quiet man of UFC four, dude. I let people get it. Uh, no, I gotta get I gotta get in that video game. I know that. <laughs> um, the I, I wanted to ask you about Mickel. There really isn't a lot to talk about. You dominated that fight right away. Um, from the camera from the camera angle that I saw. 
you locked in like a nasty arm bar, but I like the camera angle. It had panned a certain way, so I couldn't see it um, exactly what went down. But like, did you break his arm? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, 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 he was definitely injured. Uh, yeah. Um, um, be- I'm for that. It definitely, I definitely felt, I felt a few pops. Um, but uh, that's that's just kind of how I do it. Like when I'm in there, I'm, I'm there to kill. And if I get a hold of your arm um you know it's different than training i'm trying to snap that thing in half you know i'm trying mm-hmm. to take that shit home with me. so um you know it's just another part of my game where you know you need to be able to take it to that level you know that's what i tell some of the amateur guys too you got to be able to take it to that level where you're you're really trying to hurt the guy um and some people have a hard time getting to that place um sometimes it takes a loss or two for them to really feel the hurt of being embarrassed by losing for mm-hmm. them to know that that's what they need to do when they're in there but Absolutely, and the last poor bastard that you had to fight, I felt, I, 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 I got mad watching this one, I really did, and the reason why I say that, I, I don't like criticizing people, but I thought the ref did a really piss poor job of protecting Diaz after you Mark hunted him, because he never signaled that the fight was over. You walk away like, yeah, I Mark hunted the guy, he's yeah. out, and he was sleeping, and the ref like, ran over to him and and like you would think he was going to do this right but he just like runs over to him and he doesn't give you the signal the fight's over so you're doing what you're trained to do you go over and i know you don't want to hurt the guy i know you don't want to hit him but you have to and but like the ref at no point in time did he ever signal that the fight was over again he just like pushes you away and like interjects himself between you and diaz and i got kind of pissed off watching that because i was like you know what not that i was like not that it's your fault. You're doing what you're supposed to do. But, like, if I'm in Diaz's corner, I'm just like, dude, like, how did you not call that fight? How did you not stop that fight? Um, and, and you know, I've seen fighters in I your agree. position get really upset, too, because they don't want to hurt a guy unnecessarily. The fight's over. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the sport, too. I, I, I watch, you know, I can tell you're definitely into the details of fighting because that was something that uh, I, I thought I thought as well. I like to, you know, I like a referee that knows what they're doing and they can can command what's going on in there. And uh, I think he, you know, he just got caught kind of watching the show, you know, a little bit. Um, but, you know, I know what I'm doing in there. I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for the signal. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to kill this guy until you give me the signal. I, I made your job very easy for you. I knocked him down and he was basically asleep and I walked away. I can't make it any easier for you, you know, so you got to get in there and defend the fighter. But, you know, he did get up to his feet. The guy was tough. So I, I'm not going to let, you know, I'm not going to let the opportunity slip away. I'm going to go. And then I had to smack him a few times because, you know, he got in my way, but he still didn't really, you know, try to stop me. He was like half in my way, half not my way. So, um, you know, I, I wish it didn't go down like that, but I still kind of got the walk off, you know, so. Uh, I think that counts for Mark Hunt. Tough. Yeah, no, I think that's two. That's the, him and Sweeney are the two uh, walk offs. So hopefully I can keep that going. But, um, yeah, he was a tough guy. He had a bunch of kickboxing fights, I think. He had like like 30 kickboxing fights or something so um you know he was a tough guy so i'm sure he can take it you know this was okay so um you know it's 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 you know it's a fight you know it's a tough sport to be in so uh it's a fight business is a hurt business so he knows what he's getting into so um hey you, you know, we, signed- got, we got the job done i said you know, i said my piece yeah. so it was it was good you signed the contract and all bets are off after that you know i mean shit you signed the contract yeah i mean especially against me i mean i'm in there I'm in there to hurt you, you know. I'm not here to win points, you know. Some of these guys like to, like, just take guys down and lay on top of them and win rounds and hold them against the cage and all this st- stupid shit. I mean, that's not even a fight, in my opinion. So we, the, our team, time we lose in fights is when people are just, like, holding them against the cage, you know. Our guys come to fight. So um, I try to lead by example in that in that way, too. And that was one of the things I liked so much about you is because when people – I won't call it grapple fuck because it's not to say that I don't like wrestling because I do as long as you're active. If you just like lay and pray, then, you know, I'm going to boo because I paid a lot of money to sit in my seat. I don't want to see that shit. You know, if you don't like getting booed, then don't be boring. Like (laughs) that's, you know, that's my that's my tangent on that. But like one of the things that stood out to me about you having watched your fights is like all these guys want to put you up against the cage. They want to clinch you and put you up against the cage. And every single time you're able to get hooks and put them back on the cage and then either go for a sub or or go for a takedown of your own. Um I don't know why people keep trying to put you on the cage, man. Like that, I I, I don't know. I, I was perplexed having watched uh, all your fights. That seems to be what everyone likes to try to do against you. Um, but I think that's a bad idea. Yeah. 
I like to I like to beat a guy up against the cage too. If I have my back to the cage, I'm a tall guy, where I can make them use a lot of energy and uh, you know dr- drill them with elbows and and really kind of I'm on offense when my back's against the cage. So if people want to put me there, good luck. Before I let you go, Dylan, I I have to give you the kind of observation, um, being like the fighting dork that I am, and just watching all your fights. I'll take it because I I watched that last video, and I got to say you were on point with everything, either the mindset, the strategy, the game. So I'm looking forward to it. What do you got? Well, I got like, it's very simple. I don't have like a lot of like technical smart shit to say. I'll just say this, like, you are Poseidon in a kiddie pool. Like, I have those, like, little plastic tubs, you know, in my backyard that I throw, like, my five-year-old son in that, you know, I fill up to, like, his shins or whatever. You're, like, the Poseidon of that. And there's one guy that tested you, and it was Hughes. If Hughes is listening to this, like, Hughes, you're a bad motherfucker. Um, but everyone else, like, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Everyone's a pro, and I respect everybody who's willing to get in there especially for my entertainment, but there's a huge skill gap between you and the rest of these guys that you fought. So then the question becomes, like, what's next for you? You've already mentioned about the Contender Series being something you're interested in, um, but would you entertain any other opportunities like PFL or Bellator or anything like that? Yeah, we've had a few guys fight for Bellator. Um, you know, I'm trying to fight the toughest guys. It's really just whoever they can get the sign on the dotted line for me. So, I mean, I'll fight anybody. I've never turned down a fight in my life. So it's not like I'm trying to cherry pick anybody. But um, I think Bellator, you know, is an option in the future. Um, you know, the ring of combat belt means something to me personally. So I'm looking to accomplish that and, you know, kind of join the ranks of like Chris Weidman and Maya Quinta and all those guys who have held that belt. Um, but after that, it's, you know, all bets are off. FFC, um, you know, Bellator, Contender Series, anybody. I think I think after I get this belt, it's going to open some eyes for some bigger for some bigger shows. And I'm looking to take on the best in the world because, you know, that's that's what I'm in this. That's what I'm in this game to do. I want to test myself against the best because uh, I want to push the limits of what I can do. To foremost, say I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate having you on. Um, I wanted to set something up with you because you're just so damn exciting to watch. And. I really know that this is eminent. This next move after you get the belt, it's going to be eminent. I, I'm not going to be surprised when I turn on, you know, UFC Fight Night or whatever, and you're up there. Like I, that will not surprise me one bit. And um, but I'm it's it's also not lost on me. Like there's a lot of people and there's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes to put you in the position that you're in. So I'd like to give you a chance to. Give a shout out to any of your sponsors, anyone at your gym, et cetera, before we go. You know, Ray Longo, Matt said, I, I got to give props to all the all the teammates, you know, Al Jermaine and I, Quinta and Favola and all these guys, Marab, you know, he's, he's the heartbeat of the team. Um, so all those guys, you know, thank you. You know, I got to give a shout out to all my sponsors. A few that I could mention is uh, my buddy, Charlie Campbell, who's a Bellator fighter, actually has a they, uh, has a company, company Octanum Defense Series. It's a great, it's a great soap product. If anybody's involved in martial arts or any kind of like uh, you know uh, workout routines where they're getting sweaty and they need to you know protect against fungal uh, and bacteria stuff, it's a great product. Um, another guy I want to give a shout out to um, is Mike Stella, who um, it's a a guy here locally on Long Island. Um, just an absolute wizard with my body. You know, he's he's given me a few different. Um, you know, um, movements and things where my body has felt, you know, much healthier going through training camps. And, um, you know, I, I got to give him all the props in the world because, you know, he's a dedicated guy too. you know, any, any question you have, that guy, that guy has the answer. So, um, my body's feel great. And I think I'm making huge gains, um, with his guidance. So shout out to, to, to Stella and movement underground. Those guys are the best. Well, thank you, Dylan. Uh, appreciate your time. And, uh, I can't wait to have you back and I can't wait to have you on so we can talk about your UFC debut. That'll be happening soon.